Welcome everyone to our final video in chapter one. Here we're going to be talking about continuity again and the IVT, which stands for Intermediate Value Theorem. So I'm going to give you the statement of the Intermediate Value Theorem, but it's pretty intense. So we're going to draw a picture and that's going to help us quite a lot. And then we're going to be able to apply the Intermediate Value Theorem to prove that two functions actually intersect at some interval. Okay, so the Intermediate Value Theorem, here it is. Suppose that f is a nice continuous, right? We need continuity. So f is a nice continuous function on some closed interval between a and b. Really don't care about what's happening outside of that a and b. n is any number between f of a and f of b. And notice I'm writing this so I don't know which one's bigger, which one's smaller. f of a could be the big one, f of b could be the big one. I don't know, right? But the big thing is that I don't want them to be equal. And n is any value in between them. Sometimes we call that an intermediate value between f of a and f of b. All right, if that's the case, then there exists some C, and this is, stands for in, so some value C in the open interval A to B, right, so this is interval notation, such that our function at that C value is equal to N. Let me show you the picture. All right, so here is our function. I'm going to say, do, 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 do. I'm going to only draw a piece of it for right now. Here it is. Notice that at this height right here, this is going to be our f of a, the function's height at a. And over here, we're going to have f of b, the function's height at b. n can be any number between these two things, between f of a and f of b. So I'm going to say n is right here. A little bit closer to the top, doesn't really matter though. So that is our n value. And I'm gonna let this just be a dotted line going across here. Okay, and here is the game, right? I need, it's a continuous function, continuous, right here. It's a continuous function on this interval at a to b. So it's continuous, I can't lift my pencil. So I have to go from f of a to f of b. And notice whether I do it like this, or like this, or like this, or however you want to do it. I'm going to erase quite a few of these here. But no matter how you do it, somewhere it crosses the line n. It has to, right? Somehow you have to get from down below n to here above n. The only way you can do this is if you actually cross n. Some point, I don't know where, but somewhere between a and b you have to cross n. Because again, the function is continuous. So in this case, with this final one that I've decided on, here is where the function is equal to that intermediate value n. So this right here would be the c value, right? c is between a and b. Notice c is between a and b. And at c, this is equal to n. All right, so that is the intermediate value theorem. And notice that it does state, this intermediate value theorem says, that a continuous function takes on every intermediate value between f of a and f of b, right? Because n could be any number between f of a and f of b. Okay, so use the intermediate value theorem then to show that there is a root of this function on the interval one to two. So we need to remember root was a mathematical definition. It's another term for zero or solution for a function. So a zero would be where the function is equal to zero. So I want to show that this function at some point equals zero on the interval between one and two. So notice if I'm thinking about the intermediate value theorem already, I'm thinking, okay, this probably is my a value. This probably is my b value. I have my function. The only thing I really need to make sure before I apply this is that, right, we have a condition. This doesn't apply for all functions. It only applies for continuous functions. So we want to make sure that our function is continuous. And this is a big deal. Kind of for every one of these problems, you're going to have to state why this function is continuous. So in this case, our function is a polynomial. So I'm going to say since f is a polynomial, we know it's continuous on its domain. It is continuous 
on its domain, which is negative infinity to infinity, right? There's nowhere that you divide by zero. There's nowhere that you take the square root of a negative number. And so it's continuous everywhere. Therefore, it's certainly continuous on this interval right here. Okay, so I've said that the function is continuous, so therefore I can apply the intermediate value theorem. So let's go ahead. The only thing that I have left, really, that I need to show is that zero actually is an intermediate value, that it works for a choice for n. Remember, you can't just choose any n. It has to be between f of a and f of b. All right, so I'm hoping that zero is between f of a and f of b. Remember, here is my a value, here is my b value. So let's calculate these things out. So f of a, f of 1, is equal to 1 plus 1 minus 3. So that's equal to negative 1. So I have a number smaller than 0. OK, hoping this one's a number bigger than 0. So f of 2. So let's see, 2 to the fourth power is going to be 16 plus 2 minus 3. That's going to be 15. So, in fact, we do see that 0 is an intermediate value, right? It's between f of a, negative 1, and f of b, 15. OK, so let's go ahead and write our conclusion. So, let's see, we have already that it's a continuous function. And so since 0 is an intermediate value, right, negative 1 is less than 0, which is less than 15, by the intermediate value theorem, which I denote IVT, the intermediate value theorem, there is some C value. And the C value lives between A and B. So in this case, my A value is 1, my B value is 2. So C is between 1 and 2 where f of c is equal to 0, aka there is a root of this function. All right, and so the claim is we've actually done something here. Because this remark, if you wanted to solve x to the fourth plus x minus 3 is equal to 0, this is very, very difficult. We do not have the algebra skills to be able to solve this thing. And actually, just to hit home that we don't know how to solve this, beforehand, I used this nice site here, uh, Wolfram Alpha. And I went ahead and I plugged in our function, x to the fourth plus x minus 3 is equal to 0, and figured out the solutions. And this is the one right here that this is the exact answer. This is what it's equal to. This is a huge pain. This would be crazy to try to calculate out by hand. Right? So using the intermediate value theorem is for cases where we don't know the algebra skills to figure out exactly what the solution is, but at least be able to figure out a reasonable range of where it is. We know it's somewhere between 1 and 2, so maybe 1.5 is kind of a reasonable guess. Maybe in some scenarios that's good enough. And then finally, before we get up, go on to our next example, let me show you visually what we've done here. I've also graphed this in Desmos. Notice that the function here actually crosses 0. It has two roots right, at two different places. So we actually figured out that it has at least one root between 1 and 2. So OK, so here's my function, nice red one. And then I've graphed f of 1, and we got that it was a smaller value than 0. And then we graphed f of 2, and we got that it was a bigger value than 0. So we know somewhere between 1 and 2, somewhere in this interval here, it needed to have crossed. And it did, right? So here it is. It's around 1.164 is where it crossed, approximately, right? The exact answer is this right here. Crazy thing. All right. So yes, the intermediate value theorem is useful because we don't know how to solve everything exactly, right? We don't have those algebra skills. So let's try another type of problem here. This is kind of a good uh, multiple choice question. Sometimes it can show up you know, on quizzes, exams, things like this. So we have a nice continuous function, but I don't give you the equation for it. right? All I give you is this table of data. So here are the x values, here are the function's values. So on which interval must there be a c value for which f of c is equal to 4? 
So right, this is an application of the intermediate value theorem. We have a nice continuous function. And I want to make sure 4, then, is an intermediate value. So if we go down the list, right, I start at 10, 10.1, and then I drop down to 3.4. Is 4 an intermediate value? Yes. So immediately, actually, we found the answer. It is from 0 to 1. Somewhere between 0 and 1, it must have crossed 4. However, if you were to continue on, you can see that none of these other ones work, right? So we're at 3.4 and we go to 2.9. Is 4 an intermediate value between 3.4 and 2.9? No. So it doesn't have to have crossed there. How about between 2.9 and negative 1.5? No. Again, uh, 4 is not an intermediate value. It's not between 2.9 and negative 1.5. How about from negative 1.5 to 0? Again, no, 4 is not an intermediate value. And then from 0 to 0 0.8, again, no. So the only interval where it must have crossed, right? these other ones, I, I don't have all the information. It could have happened to go way up and crossed at 4. But just from this information, the only place that I can guarantee that it had to cross 4 was between 0 and 1. I know that there must be a solution to this equation between 0 and 1. So that's how I'd reason out a problem like this. OK, last up, a more advanced type of question here. I'd like to prove that this equation has at least one solution and determine what interval it's in. So this is harder. So it is an application of the intermediate value theorem. But notice, for the intermediate value theorem, I need an f of x, right? And I need an n. And I need a little a. And I need a little b, right, to determine the interval. And before, these things have been kind of given to us, right? So if I go up to this uh, problem up here, I had my f of x. The word root told me I wanted it to equal 0, which gave us our n value. And it specified the interval, right? It told us an a and a b value. But the claim is they gave you a lot of information, but they didn't have to give you this information. So this is one where you have to kind of go out and find more of these things. All right, so how do we do this? Well, looking at this right here, I'm going to go ahead and rearrange this and make this cosine of x minus x cubed is equal to 0. So now we want to know a place where this thing right here is equal to 0. So this thing right here makes sense as a function. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and guess that this right here is going to be my function. Now, in general, when you're doing these problems, the big thing is that you just get a constant on the other side. It could be 0, it could be 1, it could be 4, it could be whatever you want, but it should be a constant on the other side. Because this right here, 0, this is what we're hoping was going to be our intermediate value. Notice, now that we've rearranged this, it does look similar to our other problem, right? because I had my function equaling 0. OK, so now all we need to figure out is the a and the b value. Before, those were given to us, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, right? So I'm going to go ahead and try to find an a and a b value. 1, I'm hoping, right, because if n0 is an intermediate value, I'm hoping that one of them will give us an output smaller than 0, and one will give us an output greater than 0, right? So that way, it's an intermediate value that's between those two values. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose some things, right, and just try it out. So I'm going to try 0, right? So the x value is 0. If I was to plug that into my function, cosine of 0 would be equal to 1 minus 0 cubed is 0. So there we go. 1 minus 0 is going to be 1. OK, so that seems like a good one. I figured out a place where this is greater than 0. Now I need to find one where it's less than 0. So, OK, let's just try things, right? So my next favorite number to plug into functions, right? 0 is probably my favorite number to plug into functions. I'm going to plug in 1. So f of 1. So, OK, cosine of 1 minus 1 cubed. So 1 cubed is, of course, going to be equal to 1. All right, this is a little bit of a pain, right, because of this trig function here. It's maybe hard to determine how big cosine of 1 is, right? I don't know how to evaluate cosine of 1. I know how to evaluate like cosine of pi over 6 or cosine of pi over 3 or pi over 2 or things like that. But I don't really know how to evaluate cosine of 1. So 
right? I, if I had a calculator, I could probably figure this out. And there are tricks that we could use to determine if this is positive or negative. But let's skip this for right now. And let me try another one that maybe is easier to plug into cosine, right? So one that's easier to plug into cosine, I like something, right, after zero, I would like pi over two. That's maybe the one that I'm most comfortable with plugging into cosine. So if I plugged in pi over two, I would get cosine of pi over two. So cosine of pi over two is zero minus pi over two cubed. So pi over two cubed. Well, remember pi is around three, so this is around one and a half, cube that. But the big thing here is this minus sign, right? There's really no question that this is smaller than zero, right? So we have one case where this is bigger than zero, one case where this is smaller than zero. So somewhere between zero and pi over two, I'm thinking this thing had to have crossed zero, right? Again, here it's bigger, here it's smaller. All right, so I'm thinking in this case that A is going to be zero, it would be a good choice, and B could be pi over two. But there are other selections that we could have chosen. All right, so again, this is a proof. I'm trying to apply the intermediate value theorem to this thing. And the intermediate value theorem doesn't work for every single function. It only works for continuous functions. So I want to specify. So f of x is continuous on its domain. Because again, this is a trig function and a polynomial function being subtracted away from each other. So f of x is continuous on its domain, which in this case is from negative infinity to infinity. From this work up above, we know that zero is an intermediate value. So by the intermediate value theorem, there is a c value in the interval from a to b, right, it's the open interval from 0 to pi over 2, where f of c is equal to 0. And now notice, if you wanted to be even more specific, right, f of c being equal to 0, this would be cosine of c minus c cubed is equal to 0. If I rearrange and I make c cubed on the other side, this is cosine of c is equal to c cubed. Remember, we are trying to find a place where cosine of x equals x cubed. And the claim is this c value does it. Cosine of c is equal to c cubed. So this is the good c value that we wanted. All right, and that is the end of 1.8 and all of chapter 1. Take a quick break, then get at some of those web work homework problems. All right, I'll see you guys next time in chapter two.